on, somebody. Come on. Y'all, that is our heartbeat for today and for this season together. We're looking at who Jesus is. And over these last few months, we've spent some time looking at the cross. And last weekend, if you celebrated with us, we looked at the resurrection. Now, something we've done as a church, and I think most churches do, and it's something we're getting away from, is I think there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of buildup to Easter and the resurrection and their celebration. And then after that day comes, we stop. We move on, we shift gears. What we're going to do, we're going to stop for this month, and we're going to look at the resurrection. We're going to look at the risen Jesus, who he is, what he did. This is Matthew 28, 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I'm eternally grateful that those three words were in the scripture. One more time. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and he said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end. Father, we come to you today. We thank you that you meet us in our doubts, that you meet us in our hesitations. We thank you, God, you did not say, hey, clean your act up, then I'll meet you. Get your stuff together, then I'm coming to find you. Jesus, you knew that they betrayed you. They scattered. They dropped the ball. They did not have perfect lives. They did not even have their stuff together, but you came, you sought them out, and then you gave them purpose. God, we thank you that you meet us in our doubts and in our hesitations. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may go ahead and get cozy. Go ahead and have a seat. I got to ask you, how we doing in Ascent Church today? That's good. That was like a four out of ten. I'm embarrassed a little. Can I be honest? That kind of sucked. All right, we have our military watching all over the world. Let's give them a warm welcome. Can we welcome everyone who's new, especially our military? Like you mean it. Like you thank them. Thank you. That's better. I appreciate that. My name is Thomas Lane. Most of you call me T. Lane or Pastor T. I'm the pastor here at Ascent Church. And this is a brand new series called When They Saw Him. We're looking at the risen Lord appearing to people. And we're talking about when they saw him and how it changed everything. This is this series together. Now, our heart is this. We want to see those far from God rise to new life in Christ. That's our heartbeat. That is why we are here. We want to reach this city. We want to raise up disciples. That means fully devoted followers of Jesus. And if you are new around here, we'd love to connect with you online. We'd love if you take out your phone and you can connect with us on YouTube. And however you listen to podcasts, just find us at Ascent Church. Also, Instagram is probably the best way to stay connected throughout the entire week. Find us right there, Ascent Church VA. You can find me, my handles up here as well. We'd love to connect with you there. We're looking at the resurrection. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to two different groups of people. Some of you are new people. You're new to church. You're new to faith. Maybe this church, and a lot of us, I know your story. You grew up going to church, and you hit 18, you joined the Navy, you went off to college, you got busy, and you left. And you probably thought, I'm never coming back. But for whatever reason, life circumstances, you were here, you're back. You're new people or new-ish people. You're new to church or you're back to church. We call you new people. Some of you are new people. The rest of you, you know what I call you? Old people. All right? We got some old people. Now, the old people, you go to church every week. You know this stuff. You get it. You understand it. But whether you're a new person or an old person, regardless, the time is going to come. You're going to be at a family reunion. You're going to be at a work meeting. You're going to be at the gym or the golf course. And someone's going to say, you actually, someone's going to say, you actually believe this stuff? You, you believe, dude, you, you seem like a normal dude. You don't seem crazy. You actually believe this stuff. We need a response. We need an answer. We're looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ together. We're doing that together. This is the biggest, uh, biggest moment of all of human history. 
It's going to be worth our time these next several weeks. Matthew 28, 16 through 17, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Here's the name of the series. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I thank God in his providence and sovereignty that those three words were in scripture. But some doubted. Doubted. Now that phrase doubted could also be rendered some hesitated. Regardless, they were not expecting him. They didn't look for him. They thought, well, Jesus is dead and gone. They saw him publicly executed by professional executioners. They saw that. They saw him. They saw him. And then all of a sudden he's back. And I love for everyone in this room, it says they saw him, but some doubted. Some of them had hesitations. If we can be honest, some of us in this room, we have doubts. We have hesitations. We keep God at an arm's length. And I've had my doubts too, especially in college. That was a season of me of a lot of doubt, a lot of hesitation. And and I want to challenge you for a second. Over these next few, probably 20 or 30 minutes together on on what this looks like. Because you need to know this. The risen Jesus comes alongside our doubts. Jesus did not say, figure it out. Get your theology in order, clean up your act, be perfect, and then maybe I'll come and find you. No, he knew they betrayed him. They denied they even knew him. And he comes to them. That's good news for us, us normal people, because the risen Lord, the risen Jesus, comes alongside our doubts. He comes alongside our hesitations. I heard a lecture one time by a researcher. It was phenomenal. And one of the biggest dangers to faith is not doubt. It's unexpressed doubt. Doubt's not bad. Questions, hesitations, that's not a bad thing. The problem is when you don't feel like you can talk about them. That's what causes problems. That's what causes pain. That's what causes difficulty. And the researcher was saying the church needs to be a place. Your small group needs to be a place. You need friends, a pastor. You need people around you who, if and when you have doubts, you can talk about it. You can voice it. You can express it. In college, I had a lot of doubts, a lot of hesitations, but I didn't know who to talk to about it. I didn't quite feel like I fit in anywhere. There was, the, I, I felt like I was, I was seeking God. I didn't, I didn't quite fit in with the, my, my rowdy friends. Anyone, anyone have any rowdy friends? Anyone, is anyone right now still the rowdy friend? Maybe that's you. Okay, like I had rowdy friends in college, and they were great, but like they, kind of go, they could have gone pro at beer pong, y'all. Like skill level, like they could have been beer pong Olympians. They were incredible, and they were kind people, good people, but they didn't want to talk about this. I I couldn't talk to them about it. And then I had, like, the Christian crowd, who on the outside looked perfect. And they carried their Bibles wherever they went, and they went to the prayer and the event and the small group. They went to every Christian thing. I didn't feel like I quite fit in with them either because I like to go to church, but I also like to have a Miller Light or two. Some of you look like you like to have a Miller Light or two as well. Some of you are smiling and elbowing someone. Some, some of y'all sound like you got some college stories, which we could talk about, which we will refrain from right now. I didn't feel like I could talk to them about it. I, I had nowhere to turn. It's a dangerous place to be. You need to understand this, y'all. Doubt is a fine place to start, but it's a bad place to remain. It's fine to start there. It's fine if you're like, I got some questions. I got some hesitations. That's fine, but it's a bad place to remain. Here's what I found is this, and I don't want to be too aggressive, but I want to call some of us out. A lot of us have this moral high ground, the superiority of like, I am seeking God. If I were to say, where are you at? You're like, I'm seeking God. Haven't landed anywhere, but I'm seeking God. I'm studying, I'm researching, I'm in between, I'm trying to figure it out, I'm asking questions. And here's what that does. That gives us a moral check. We've done it. We're seeking after God. But you know what it also gives you? If you haven't landed anywhere, it gives you a license to live your life however the heck you want. If that's you, you can have sex with whoever you want. You can spend your money wherever you want. You can forgive or not forgive anyone you want. You can do whatever the heck you want to do. And a lot of us live there. We don't pass through doubt. And if I were to ask you, oh, you're, you're seeking God, you're trying to figure it out, what are you doing? Most people, if we could be honest, we're not reading books. We're not researching. We're, we're just in this moral in-between, this theological in-between. Doubt is a fine place to start, but listen, it's a bad place to remain. And what I'm about to say is going to get some of y'all in trouble, but I need to talk about it anyway. Some of y'all are in between. Some of y'all have been dating somebody 
for like five or six years. No one paid me to bring this up, by the way. Some of y'all have been engaged for like four or five years. In the South, we have a, we have a saying. Now, I've lived up North, and the most disappointing thing about the North was not the freezing cold. It was the lack of cool Southern sayings. I've lived up there. The North don't have those. They don't have country sayings. In the South, you know what we say when someone's in between? We say, paint or get off the ladder. Has your mama ever told you, your daddy, paint or get off the ladder? It means you're in between, make a decision, make a call. Some of y'all are engaged, right? It's been five or six years. Some of y'all are dating, right? Paint or get off the ladder. I'll do the wedding right here, son. <laughs> we'll turn this into a wedding ceremony. I thought he was going to get a ring. <laughs> I was like, I'm, he's already married, though. Some of your habits, I'm, I'm, this is good. I like the reaction of the last two services. I got to see. Some of your, um, your hobby is not scrolling on Instagram. It's not scrolling on Facebook. Some of your hobbies is scrolling on Zillow. Where are my Zillow people at? You look at houses all the time. You are not even in the market for a house. You got a house. Or you're looking at houses you know you can't afford. You don't care. We're in between. Am I going to buy this or not? Am I, I'm, I'm kind of there. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm in between. Um, my family's currently in the market for a minivan. That is a natural reaction. There was a pocket of like six people who started laughing. That's really, that's the appropriate response. The last two services, someone said, woo! I said, that proves me. You don't have one. It's easy to look. It's easy to look on CarMax, Carvana. It's easy to look, but, but at some point, you've got to commit. You've got to make a decision. Amen. Three things we've got to talk about. If someone asks you, or, or if you're struggling with this, listen, point one is this. These claims are too important not to look into. They're too important. We talked on this briefly at Easter that there's more scams than ever before. But the main idea today in the secular world is this, is this, is that, and I, I believe this at some point in my life, is this. Jesus was a good, kind teacher, and then he died. And his followers missed him and felt guilty for betraying him. And so they made up all these stories to forgive themselves and to make themselves feel better. And it's just something they did. And, and these stories just got spread and spread. And that is absolutely garbage. Because of point two, these claims are too damaging to falsify. Now, there have been religious movements, religions, cults, political movements, where if you join them, you will benefit. If you join this cult or this political movement or whatever, this revolution, if you join it, you'll get sex, power, money, land. That's a motivating thing for a lot of people. But no one who pushed these ideas gained anything. They lost everything. They didn't gain notoriety. They lost it. They didn't gain fame. They were, they were crucified upside down. Something happened. Something happened that radically changed their lives. Now, I don't know if you know this, but there were other, um, even to this day, there's people who come around and say, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Son of God. I'm, I'm here. And, and uh, back in those days, too, there were other people in Jesus' day that came around and said, I'm, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior of the world. And, but, but, and they, would, they would build up a following. And you know what happened to the leader? The leader would eventually die. And you know what everyone else did? They went back to normal life. And that's what started to happen with Jesus. Jesus was this guy. He's the son of God, right? Everyone sees him. They saw him die. And you know what his followers did? They went back to business. In Luke, we see this, these two people going back to their town. And the idea is, well, they said this. They said, we thought he'd be the one. We thought he was the guy. Obviously, he's not. He's dead. In the book of John, we see Jesus' close followers who are fishermen. You know what they do after Jesus is dead? They go back to fishing. Business as usual, swing and a miss. We thought he was the guy, he's obviously not. Back to the family business, back to normal. Something happened which transformed this uneducated, maybe some of them were illiterate, disorganized, leaderless, cowardly, betraying group of individuals. Of individuals. Something happened which, which served as a catalyst to create a movement 
which not only transformed the ancient world, which is still transforming the world today. And that catalyst was the resurrection. They saw him. They saw him. And you can almost see it in the New Testament. They're like, we don't know what you want us to do. We saw him. We touched him. We ate with him. We talked to him. This wasn't like some guy off by himself said he had a dream and this happened and you're taking my word for it. The New Testament claims that the risen Jesus, still with the scars on him, appeared to hundreds and hundreds of people at the exact same time. He ate with them. You can have a dream, maybe, but you can't hallucinate someone who comes and has a sandwich with you. It's a different level. And if one person says that, oh, that's, a little, that's a little messy, I don't know if that's right, but all of them did. And not only that, they went out and they preached this, they said this, they would not back down, and many of them lost absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. These claims are too damaging to falsify. Th the third thing I want you to know is these claims are too counterproductive to fabricate. The popular idea today is that the New Testament, at least, was just made up. It was made up by the leaders of the movement to val validate their position, to say, follow me, this is the right way. If I, if, if I was writing this about me, right, if I'm one of the apostles and I'm writing this, I would do such a better job. If you, when I hear a professor, someone say, oh, these are fabricated, these are made up by the early church. Listen, the apostles who apparently are making this up in a thin air, they look like idiots on every single page. Jesus is talking to them, they don't understand it. They don't get it. They, they, don't, they don't understand, they don't get it, they're not expecting it. Jesus calls them, <laughs> he calls them some things, he calls them little faith all the time. At one point, Peter... Um, Jesus comes to Peter, and Jesus calls Peter Satan. Now, if you're Peter, if you're the leader of the movement, would you just make that part up? Oh, yeah, the Son of God called me the devil one time. Who make that up? Jesus Christ is in the garden asking, is there a way out of it? Would you just make that up? Would you, would you just fabricate that? Who are the first people to see the risen Lord? Is it the, is it the apostles? No, they're hiding in fear. It's the women at the tomb. Would you make that up? If I were making it up, I would be the first one there. I would be like, yes, Lord, we've been waiting for you. No, 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 they were hiding in fear. They were cowardly. They had to admit that we weren't, we weren't even looking for them. Not only were we not looking, we were too scared to leave the house. The women, they, they are the ones. You know why it's there? Because it happened. Listen, if you struggle with this, and I, I have too. I'm, I'm not coming at you. I, I understand. Please research. Please look into this. If you need books, research, articles, put, let us know on social media. We'll send them to you for free. We'll just send them to you. This is too important to ignore. Th this is a different account. This is in Luke when Jesus shows up to them. They're hiding in a house, and Jesus shows up, and it says, this is weird. Now, t tell me about the spiritual meaning behind this. It says, and while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? What's the spiritual significance of Jesus wanting snacks? Jesus is my boy. He's always hungry, too. I like this guy. Verse 42, they, they gave him a piece of broiled fish. It's real spiritual. Broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Jesus Christ wanted Captain George's. Is this why Baptists are always having a fish fry right here? Because Jesus wanted fish? I don't know. What, what's the spiritual teaching of that, absolutely nothing other than the fact it actually happened. He actually appeared, he asked them for food, and they gave him broiled fish. Why include that detail? Because they remember. They saw him. Tim Keller tells us these are marks of eyewitness testimony. Now, modern fiction, modern stories, include extra details to make the story seem legit. But that is a modern thing. Ancient writing did not do that. Read the Odyssey. Read Beowulf. Read some of these ancient stories. They don't have that. C.S. Lewis, who was a professor, said this, who came to faith. He was a skeptic, bigger skeptic than anyone in this room who came to faith. He said this, a professor. He said, I've been reading poems, romances, vision, literature, legends, and myths all my life. 
I know what they are like. I know none of them are like this. Of this gospel text, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage, meaning either this is an eyewitness report, or else some unknown ancient writer, without known predecessors or successors, suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern, novelistic, realistic narrative. The professor being snarky. Either they just somehow made this all up, a new genre out of the blue, or this is reporting. Richard Bauckham, he's a prof- he was a professor at the University of Edinburgh, said this. He said, testimony should be treated as reliable until proved otherwise. First, trust the word of others, then doubt if there are any good reasons for doing so. If you want to read a book, it's by him, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. It's probably the best um, account of, of why the New Testament stories are legitimate. Back to Matthew. He comes to them. Remember how he came to them? They were doubting. They had hesitations. He comes to them anyway. Then Jesus came to them. He's always coming to us. He said this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is a great little summary. This has kind of guided the early church and the modern church forever. And if you read it quickly, there's four commands. This is what Jesus wants us to do. Pretty simple. Go, make disciples, teach, baptize. Four things, four checklists. We could do that. But if we look at the Greek, and I did because I'm a nerd, there's actually only one command in there from Jesus. Like, what are you talking about? He actually, there's only one imperative, which means only one command. And the only command in this whole little, little chunk is the command to make disciples. The rest are participles. Follow me, because this I know is super nerdy. Jesus basically says this, going, teaching, and baptizing, make disciples. Or in other words, he basically says, go, he basically says, make disciples. How are we going to do it? But go, by going, by teaching, by, by um, baptizing. Going, teaching, and baptizing describe making disciples. That's what he calls us, me, and you to do. The risen Jesus demands that we go all in. You saw they had doubts. You saw they had hesitations. He commands not only them to be disciples, but to make other disciples. I, I want to talk to the parents for a second. Or, or is anyone here a parent, an aspiring parent, knows a parent? Anyone had a parent? All right, that should be all of you, right? Okay, listen, okay, I want to talk to the parents. This is not a parenting sermon, but I need 20 seconds for you, especially if you have little kids. Parents, your main job is not to make your kids like you. Your main job is to make disciples. And if you are properly making disciples, often your child will not like you. But you're being a good parent. Teach them, guide them, show them the way. If you can help them, Learn the mistakes you've learned, not by walking through the muck, but by taking your word for it. That's the best way to do it. And often a sign that you're making a proper disciple is they are angry at you right now. That means you're being a good parent. The risen Jesus demands we go all in. I got to give you a little illustration real quick before we continue. And I got to be careful because people don't mind me talking about controversial topics, but y'all, some of y'all are crazy when it comes to pets and animals. And I can tell you you're a sinner who radically needs the grace of God. You're like, yeah, that's true. But if I talk about your dog, you're ready to throw down. <laughs> I'm not talking about your dog, okay? And it's too easy to make fun of your cat, so I won't even do that. I want to talk to you because I love animals. I love little cute little animals. But one animal I don't like is squirrels. Do you know why? Squirrels will get in your attic. Squirrels are basically giant, bold, outdoor rats. It's a scary thing. You know why else why I don't like squirrels? Because every time I'm driving down my street, they play chicken with me and my Honda Accord. I think they sit in the tree and wait. I think they do. I think they wait, and they're in the tree, and they're laughing, and they're like, here comes that idiot in his accord. Let's get him. And I think they, 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 they go, and they, they, they get. I'm with my kids. 
So I can't hit the squirrel. I can't hit the squirrel, it would be on the news. Pastor T hates animals, I can't do it. <laughs> Pastor T hit a squirrel, he did it on purpose. Don't go to a sent church, it would be on the, in the paper. Okay? And the squirrels see me, I'm coming down the road in my Honda Accord, and I see him, and they'll go in the middle of the street, and they'll go, and they'll look, and they'll go, and I say, make a decision! And they juke me, and they laugh at me, and they get in their little squirrel tree, and they give each other a little fist bump and a handshake. <laughs> they tell each other, they say, that was a good one. You really got him. He's really mad to start his day now. If, if there's any squirrels in the house, I just want to tell you, make a decision. Make a call. You can't live in the middle. You're going to get hit. But Choose. Go this way or that way. Don't live life in between. There's no credibility to that. The reason I'm telling you this is we made up a term this, this day. First time to hear it. A lot of us, I believe, we're squirrel Christians. We're in the middle. And I kind of, kind of like Jesus, I kind of don't. I'm, I'm kind of following him, but I'm, but, but I'm kind of not. I'm, I'm going to be with him on this issue, but not, not on this one. I'm half in, half out. And this is a dangerous place to be because you can get hit. Make a call. I'm not saying be stupid. I'm not saying no research. Research. Think, but don't live your life in this limbo, in this in-between of I'm kind of in, I'm kind of out. What is a Christian? Is it someone who votes a certain way? Is it someone who goes to all the worship concerts in town? No, 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 it's this. We are disciples. We are learners of Jesus. We are followers of Jesus. We sit at the Lord's feet. We are not called to casually belong to a group. We are called to wholeheartedly belong to a person. That is what being a disciple is. It's not why I go to that church or I'm, I'm a Christian by name. No, no, no. That, that's fine. I'm not mad at that. We're called to belong to him. It's about following him, obeying him, making my life after him. In Acts chapter 2, when the apostles get a little bold, the Holy Spirit comes in and they start preaching. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, they said, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, he said, repent and be baptized. That means turn back and be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean for me? What does it mean for you? I, I just want you to know do not use doubt or hesitation to live mildly committed, in between, wishy-washy, squirrely lives. Commit and go all in. And you can have doubts and do that. Did you know that? You can have hesitations and do that. The risen Lord will come alongside you and walk with you. They have hesitations. They have doubts. They're still worshiping him. He's still giving them a purpose. He's still giving them a calling. He's giving them an identity. And if you swallowed the pill, if you bought into the lie that I have to have all the answers before I can go all in with God, you're never going to be there. If you've got to say, I've got to get it to the point, I have no doubts, no hesitations, no questions, nothing. It's not a place we can live. We can go all in right now. I want to celebrate with you because last time I looked, on April 21st, right here, 33 people are going public with their faith through the waters of baptism right here, right in that spot, son. It's a huge deal. And a lot of them, if I can use my old phrasing, are new people. But I want to call on all the old people. And I want you to be here to celebrate, even if you don't know them, this is a massive win for the kingdom, for the city, for our church, for the future. And I want you to know there's room for you. Maybe you thought about it, but you're like, well, I, don't, I, I got some questions. That's fine. It's okay. We want to walk alongside you. Jesus wants to do the same thing. You can register at our website. Please do. We're going to have a party that day. The question remains, how can I be sure? How can I be sure? I heard a preacher say one time, listen, when God decided to send salvation, he didn't send an airtight argument. He sent an airtight person. He didn't send an abstract principle, he sent a human being. And a lot of us say, okay, pastor, you give me three points, three reasons, logically, on why I should be a Christian. God didn't even do that. He could have sent you an email. 
He could have sent you a tablet from heaven. He didn't do that. He sent his son. And he doesn't say, look at this logical argument. He says, look at my son. Look at how he lived. Look at what he did. Look at what he said. Look at how he died. How he died for you. Historian Philip Schaff said this. I love this. Listen to this. I know you're hungry for lunch. Chill out. You'll get to brunch on time, baby. You'll be good. Listen to this. He said, this Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Muhammad, and Napoleon. Without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced efforts which lie beyond the reach of order or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more sermons, orations, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. That's Jesus. How can I be sure? How can I be sure? The, the, the context of this passage, don't forget, it's doubt and it's uncertainty. They had questions, they had doubts, they had hesitations. They were unsure. Look how the passage ends. They were unsure. Look what Jesus says. Matthew 28, 20, he says, to a people unsure, to a people doubting, to a people with hesitations, he says, and surely, with certainty, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. That word surely is a Greek word, edu, it means look. It's a very popular word. It means just look. Open your eyes and look. The Bible does not say, oh, blind faith, shut your eyes, pray, maybe God will, will convince you. It doesn't say it. It says, look. You can literally translate this, and look, I am with you always. To the very end of the age. Listen, when I have doubts, he is sure. He is surely with us. He surely came. Surely live the life I couldn't live. He surely died on that cross for my sins and for yours. He surely was raised on the third day. He is surely with us. And surely he will always be with us. When you have doubts and you have hesitations, Jesus doesn't say, ah, no, you can't do that. No, he says, look. He says, look. He says, open your eyes and look. He says, look to me to me on that cross dying for you. He says, look to my scars. He says, look to my teaching. Look at the, look how the way I, I welcome everyone. He says, look. When we have doubts, when we have hesitations, may we be a people. I wish he or she not in between. May we, may, we, may we move forward. May we lift our eyes. May we look at who he is and at what he's done. May we look to the cross. May we look to the gospel. life for you. We can let you give us purpose and identity and, and you can send us out to change the world even though we have a doubt or two or hesitations or questions. It's okay. They're not mutually exclusive. If anyone in this room today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you want to, know this. He's been after you your whole life. He's been chasing you, pursuing you. Just like he came to them in their doubts, he's coming to you in your doubts. If you'd like to do what, the, what, what Acts said, is to, to repent, to turn to him. To be baptized, you can do that. If you want to receive him today, if you want to repent, it means turn back and turn to him today. And you're not even sure what to say. You can pray something like this between you and him. You can say, Father, I want to know you. 
accept me not based on what I've done, but based on what Jesus has done for me. Thank you that Jesus died as a, my substitute on the cross. Thank you that Jesus gives me a name, an identity, and a purpose. Thank you, Lord, that you come alongside our doubts, our questions, our hesitations. And that we don't have to live there in indecision. We can follow you. We can say yes. You can still send us out. You can still give us an identity and purpose. You can still do that. You're going to come alongside our doubts and hesitations. May they hold us back no longer. Father, we repent. We turn to you. Except it's not based on what we've done, but on what Jesus has done for us. If anyone in this room, if you prayed that prayer or something like it, if you received him today, we want to know. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come forward. I just want to pray for you before we leave today. If you've received him today, if you prayed that prayer or something like it, as many others have done today, if that's you, with no one looking but me, would you raise your hand in the air right here and now so I can pray for you before we leave? Lift your hand high. Praise God. Father, for the three hands I see, I ask you to fill them with your Holy Spirit, your mercy, your goodness, your grace. Give them an identity, a name, a purpose. May they know, may we all know that you come alongside us. You seek us out. You come to our doubts, our hesitation. You find us. You give us things to be sure of, sure that you love us, sure that you have a plan for us, sure that you're God, that you're good.